a minute late. Sorry about that. Yeah. And Carl, I'll give you co-host. Lovely. Okay. And do you want me to pin to spotlight um, Michael? Yeah. Okay. I'll do that as soon as I remember how. Oh, I can't have coffee. Ah. Oh. 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 At well, this time of day, I have tea. It's tea, mate. Always tea here. And the English influence. Yeah, I was going to say, that's because you're a member of the empire, citizen of the empire or something. Okay, I think that was a spotlight for Michael. All right, well, hopefully the internet's good this today. Yesterday at 9 a.m. it went off here, so. Um... Okay. Uh, can you still oh, hear? No. Yep. Okay, because I moved my microphone. Sometimes that disconnects it. Okay, so Michael, <laughs> we have 12 people here. Okay, and... that might as well begin. Yep. All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to uh, another quarterly Patreon session with uh, Michael Hudson, Professor Michael Hudson, author of over a dozen books, including his latest, The Temples of Enterprise. My name's Carl Fitzgerald. I'll be your host today. I'm an economist uh, based in Australia that has changed three taxes uh, protecting communities from speculative uh, over overreach in our community. In our, uh, Lifetimes. So uh, it's just, uh, yeah, Michael. The the role of um, property continues to uh, expand, and uh, you sent me a great e news uh, as we often reference the Mr. Matt Stoller and his big um, newsletter. Uh, this um, software algorithm real page that led to some FBI dawn raids. Uh, what do you think about this form of price fixing? Wait, uh, I don't understand the question. Well, uh, with Matt Stoller, um, he revealed that um, the FBI raided um, a, a company that's been involved in um, uh, a software algorithm that yes. coordinates rental increases. Oh, that's right, to try to uh, coordinate rents. Uh <laughs> That's been happening in quite a few different countries. They're they're trying to make sure that uh, landlords do not lower uh, the rents uh, just to get uh, customers. They want them to hold out and say, if you want housing, you have to pay the high uh, prices that we're charging. And we want to make sure that all the landlords are acting together as a monopoly uh, to prevent any housing that uh, people uh, can uh basically afford at uh what used to be 25 percent of their income and is now up to 43 percent or for renter uh 43 percent for uh buyers and over 50 percent uh for many renters now so yes they're trying to increase the price of housing and of course that helps uh price american labor out of the market which is just one more reason that americans are buying imports and uh, deindustrializing. So you would think that uh, supporting Stoller's uh, uh, criticism of the landlord's uh, monopoly would be uh, to help uh, the economy, much as uh, David Ricardo's critique of uh, the pro-landlord uh, uh, corn laws in 1815 was aimed at making uh, English uh, industrial labor more competitive. Uh, uh, and not make indus uh, industry uh, flourish in uh, other countries. Certainly. And uh, when you think of those um, rental price increases, uh, is affordable housing and um, uh, the right to shelter the frontier to our freedom? There's not much uh, affordable housing being built today. The Most of the housing is for uh, very wealthy people 
uh, not simply McMansions, uh, but real palaces for uh, the billionaires and the multimillionaires that are developing. There's uh, uh, very little housing uh, for the people. Although I must say the uh, uh, the subways, I took a subway uh, today from Manhattan uh, to here and the subways certainly are uh, the new affordable housing here in New York. Right, uh, Patreons uh, fire in those questions. Usually we've got a few coming through by now. Um, so please use the Q&A um, panel here um, on Zoom. That would be great. Um, Michael, uh, the, the the Temples of Enterprise now has uh, has been released. So congratulations on that. Yeah. Uh, it describes uh, the most basic features of Western economic organisation, money, interest-bearing debt, markets, land tenure and enterprise. What role did the temples and the palaces in the Near East play in creating these these sort of uh, foundations of, of modern life? Well, the Temples of Enterprise are a collection of my academic articles, uh, beginning with the, the 25 years that I was associated with Harvard's anthropology department, which included its archaeology department. Uh, and my field there was in Babylonian economics. And uh, what I had wanted to do in the six colloquiums that I organized uh, through Harvard, uh, bringing all, uh, all the specialists that we could find in uh, Sumerian, Babylonian, Assyrian, uh, Judaic, and uh, Iranian uh, societies, was I wanted to find out how the economic practices of modern civilization developed. Money, exchange, prices, uh, all, all and land tenure uh, and the relationship between the public sector and the private sector, which turned out to be really between the temples, the palaces, and the family-based uh, community on the land. Well, what I found out was that what uh, uh, there was a whole break in civilization that uh, the money and uh, uh, the the way in which uh, Middle Eastern civilization was organized from the third millennium right down to the end of the first millennium BC was a completely different form of civilization. The, uh, it was, I won't say that it's socialist, but it was a uh, palatial uh, dominated economy with a, a ruler aiming at keeping the economy in overall balance and preventing economic imbalance preventing dependency. And what that worked out in practice was that the Near Eastern civilization aimed at preventing an oligarchy from developing and uh, especially a creditor oligarchy from developing and expropriating the landowners uh, and the self-sufficient population on the land and essentially taking over the government uh, itself. And what I found was that around... Uh, 750 BC, when the Near East finally began to trade with uh, Greece, Italy, and uh, the, we the West in general, uh, the West developed a completely different form. There was no divine kingship. There were no uh, palace rulers empowered to cancel the debts and redistribute the land to debtors who had lost them to creditors and to restore economic balance. And what I found was that the um, e economic models that the uh, Babylonians, uh, certainly the Sumerians before them, taught their students were more sophisticated than any model used in the West today, any model by the National Bureau of Economic Research, uh, because they realized that there were two basic dynamics in any economy. There was the dynamic of uh, tan tangible growth, the growth of herds, the growth of uh, uh, the economy, uh, population, and that was an S-curve. Uh, and they, they, plan they worked out the mathematics of the S-curve so carefully, they had quadratic equations and um, all uh, mathematics that usually isn't taught until college uh, uh, these days. Uh, and original translators thought, well, this must be just a statistical report. Uh, of, of herds growing, but it turned out to be the training, uh, the training that scribal students had. 
Well, in a, a contrast to this S curve, they had to plot the exponential growth of uh, debt. And uh, the question was, how long does it take debt to, uh, to double at a given interest rate? Well, for commercial debts at that time, which were fixed at 20%, uh, they were fixed to double uh, in five years. And if they double in five years, that worked out to one fifth a year or, or 20%. They didn't use uh, uh, the uh, decimal system. They used the 60 based system. Well, uh, what they found was that if the economy grows at an S curve and uh, debts grow this way, that there's going to be a disparity. What do you do with the disparity? In today's world, if the debts are, grow faster than the economy, the economy goes bankrupt and the debtors forfeit their property to an increasingly wealthy oligarchy at the top of the pyramid. Uh, the Near East could not have afforded that. If you would have let uh, the land, uh, the landed up, we could call it the peasantry, the families on the land lose the land uh, to the creditors, then they wouldn't. Uh, they would have to spend uh, their uh, labor time working for the creditor, not uh, on building uh, public infrastructure uh, in the off season and not serving in the army. And any uh, a, a Bronze Age society that would have followed modern economic models would have collapsed and uh, you could say deindustrialized, but they would, in their case, they would have de, uh, de agriculturalized and deindustrialized, uh, just like the United States is doing. And so they realized that uh, the uh, the economic market did not provide economic mar uh, balance. That the the marketplace, if you, uh, of uh, finance and the, the real economy, tended to get out of kilter and had to be restored periodically, uh, not with a set number of years, but whenever there was a new ruler, uh, the, uh, there would be a clean slate, an underarm, basically a jubilee year, the word for uh, uh, the Babylonian word for uh, the clean slate was uh, duror, uh, was underarum, which is uh, the uh, Hebrew language picked up as duror uh, when the uh, Babylonian, uh, the uh, Jewish exiles returned from Babylonia and uh, uh, rewrote the Bible in the uh, modern form that it is. Well, uh, the uh, it's it just amazing. You'd think that in the United States. Uh, I, I began to work out my own models of economic growth. And again and again, any model you make of the United States economy or any Western economy finds that debt is growing faster and faster. Look at the global South countries. Look at Latin America. Look at Argentina. Uh, and uh, look at Africa. Uh, the debt is growing so rapid that uh, what... What are they going to do? If you don't cancel the debts and write it down, uh, you're going to be let the International Monetary Fund come in and impose austerity on you. And the austerity is going to uh, prevent uh, the development of the labor force, prevent uh, industrial capital investment, uh, prevent infrastructure development, which is needed for an industrial economy. And uh, you'll end up uh, in a collapse the ancient Near East was able to avoid this kind of collapse. That's what's so remarkable. And it really worked out into a different uh, philosophy of civilization. And the reason that this is so relevant today is the world is once again splitting into two civilizations right now. The uh, US and Europe, uh, the West, uh, uh, basically is run by the financial sector, uh, uh, the finance, sort of an international cosmopolitan financial sector uh, has been dominating economies uh, ever since uh, the late feudal period. And uh, you, you have uh, the uh, BRICS plus uh, dominated by China and also Russia, where uh, the monetary system and the credit system is constant, is a public function. It's uh, the Bank of China 
that uh, creates uh, the credit and decides uh, what the economy needs uh, financing for in order to grow. And when a, a company, whether it's an industrial company or a, a real estate company, uh, when uh, they can't pay, the uh, Chinese don't say, well, you're broke. I guess the creditors can take over and it'll no longer be a public function. It'll now be a private function. The Chinese can write down the debt. Essentially, they can uh, use uh, bankruptcy on a, uh, a national level. And I think in the discussions now that they're having with the other BRICS countries, they are trying to uh, create a uh, system of international credit where uh, the uh, creditor nations probably write down China. Now, China is a dominant one because it's going to be investing in the Belt and Road Initiative, building up transport infrastructure and other financing infrastructure in other countries. Uh, they're, they're not using uh, credit in order to uh, bankrupt the country, bankrupt its labor, uh, reduce it to uh, pauper labor and take over the government like occurs in the West. Uh, they're, they're treating it either as an equity investment or they say this is a long-term uh, investment and you don't have to repay us until the infrastructure that we're putting in enables you to create the money to uh, pay us back, pay for the uh, infrastructure that uh, we've uh, adv advanced to you. Uh, in, in some ways, this is very much like the line that Islam st tried to start out with, saying uh, we don't want to have uh, any kind of a debt relationship or usury. There was no difference in ancient languages between usury and interest. Any charging of interest uh, was called uh, usury. And instead, Islamic function said uh, all credit should be in the form of equity, so that if the uh, debtor cannot pay, then uh, the uh, the creditor has to share in the loss. It's not just a bad debt, it's a, a loan gone bad. In other words, a bad loan. So you have Islam, uh, because it comes from the Middle East, uh, retaining this whole millennia long tradition of the Middle East of keeping money as a public en enterprise and not permitting the uh, debt and financial system to polarize society. The attempt is to prevent society from being polarized uh, in, in between the 90% and the 10%, or in America between the 99% and the 1%. Uh, this, is, this is what other societies and uh, its civilizations were able to avoid. Western civilization has not uh, 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 adopted this uh, overriding uh, regulatory authority that was common for the survival for all Bronze Age and uh, Near Eastern societies uh, for three millennia. Well, Michael, I haven't heard you talk much about um, Islam. Uh, are there any other economic um, uh, ec economic tools in the Quran in the Quran that we should know about? Uh, just the just the laws of interest uh, uh, that they have uh, their the rationale for preventing interest uh, that that's uh, the main thing that uh, Muhammad uh, uh, pushed for and at the time that Muhammad uh, uh, is, uh, developed uh, Islam uh, there there was a revulsion throughout the entire uh, wor world including the Roman world all the way to Persia. Uh, uh, for austerity, there was almost a revulsion against wealth and its excesses. They, they saw that wealth was addictive, that uh, wealthy people tended to uh, seek power over uh, debtors, over people who were not wealthy, and the result was to tear society apart. And uh, they, uh, the, the way to avoid tearing society apart, they thought, was to prevent uh, wealthy families from developing. And by the Renaissance, even uh, uh, theologians like Orisma said, uh, what are we going to do about wealthy families in the city? If a city lets a wealthy family develop, then maybe the city should exile the family. This certainly was a discussion in Florence, Italy, uh, where you had uh, uh, wealthy families developing. Uh, already in Dante's uh, Inferno, you have a... Uh, uh, you, you have this discussed. What do you do to prevent wealth? Well, the main way to prevent wealth uh, in a world where most wealth was achieved 
by financial means, not by uh, innovation and creating new industry and adding to production, but purely is a predatory zero transact zero sum uh, transaction. Uh, the way that was to prevent uh, wealthy families. Uh, wealthy families tried to avoid this by saying, "Well, we give money to the poor," and uh, that's what uh, the church uh, said: give money to the poor. Uh, but in order to uh, consult, to avoid and prevent their societies from uh, having these corrective checks, uh, the the Roman Catholic Church uh, emerged at the time of. Uh, 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 Saint Augustine, uh, and especially by by the time of the Crusades, uh, the the role of the Roman Church was to destroy all uh, wage war against all of Christianity, uh, and the this was made very explicit uh, in the 11th century by the papal dictates uh, uh, that uh, uh, said, "Here is uh, uh, we have to rule uh, all the other." Uh, uh, all, all other Christian groups and the Crusades were fought against Christians primarily. Uh, they were, first of all, the, the big enemy already in 1052 was uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church and, uh, the, the, and uh, along with Antioch and uh, uh, other uh, uh, Eastern churches, uh, Rome declared war on them uh, and tried to excommunicate. Uh, them, but uh, the 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 most vicious uh, uh, Roman Catholic war was against Germany, uh, which would not let uh, Rome take over. Uh, against uh, France, the Cathars, uh, and against uh, Sicily and uh, southern Italy, uh, where either the uh, Orthodox Christians from Constantinople uh, had uh, colonies or which were Islamic. And uh, until Roman Catholicism, uh, there uh, all the different religions were uh, living together. In Jerusalem, for instance, uh, there were Christian churches, Islamic churches, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, Orth Orthodox churches. Uh, th th there was no uh, hatred of uh, people with a different religion. It was uh, Christianity that said, "Well, we we have to uh, we we have to have." Uh, an oligarchy taking over, and that oligarchy has to be has to support the church. Rich people are are great. The one thing that they uh, above all the Christian fight was to uh, uh, to distort uh, and, and mistranslate uh, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and this is what my book on uh, forgiving their debts was about. Uh, uh, when Jesus said forgiven their debts, he meant debts. And uh, the contemporary translations into uh, into uh, Greek uh, made it very clear that it was debts, and uh, all of the surrounding uh, Christian uh, uh, this discussion was obviously about monetary debts. With Saint Augustine said, uh, "No, it's not about uh, financial debt at all. We can't say cancel the debts because they're the rich people, they're our church, they're our bishops. Uh, so it's sin." Uh, especially sexual sin. And all of a sudden, they changed uh, the whole function of religion away from economic balance, getting rid of the creditors to uh, uh, sex. Uh, and uh, this was especially, uh, uh, there was still a, a dislike of usury in the Christian church. The church councils uh, kept uh, promoting uh, the uh, sanctions against usury, uh, and uh, especially they didn't want church people to make uh, uh, interest-bearing loans. But then came the Crusades, and uh, the the, uh, the uh, Catholic Church said uh, in the 11th century, uh, they said, how are we going to uh, conquer other countries and uh, essentially kill everybody who disagrees with us? Uh, they, they were like ISIS uh, today. And they said, well, what they did was they uh, they didn't have an army. And uh, the, you remember when Stalin joked in World War II, uh, uh, Churchill, uh, I think, said, well, you know, what are you going to do about uh, the Catholic Church? And uh, uh, Stalin said, well, how many troops does the Pope have? 
Well, uh, the this was the problem in uh, uh, 1050, 1075. And so the, uh, the church uh, began to make deals with warlords, especially the Normans, the Northmen, who had invaded uh, southern Italy just to, as mercenaries uh, working for rivals. And they said, uh, uh, they, first of all, the first one was uh, in uh, Sicily in southern Italy. You know, we'll make you king if you pledge uh, to make your land a fief. Of the uh, of the Pope, so they uh, they backed uh, Robert Guiscard, the warlord leader, and made made him uh, the king. And then a few years later, uh, they had uh, uh, William uh, of uh, the, of the conqueror. They said, "We will make you a conqueror, and we will uh, we'll let we'll back you in conquering England, and we'll have the Church back you if you pledge to make England a fiefdom of the Pope and pay us Peter's print, pay, pay Peter's pence, pay us uh, the tribute." Just like our friend Robert Dick Wiesgar did. So the uh, the if you look at what uh, the Roman papacy did, it's very much like the United States backing client oligarchies uh, throughout Latin America and through the rest of the world, or in, uh, for instance, in uh, Ukraine even, uh, uh, on to create a, a country. Uh, an economy that is willing to turn over its economic surplus to the United States. And the book that I've been writing for the last few years, uh, the third volume in my trilogy, uh, I was going to call it uh, Tyranny of Debt, but I think I'll call it a, a political history of fin uh, uh, finance and Western civilization. I have to think of a more catchy title, but that's basically what it is. Uh, the the whole way the the way in which mo the modern West has been uh, shaped by the fight of uh, Rome against uh, all the other Christian churches uh, to take over and to uh, essentially to uh, it was Rome that uh, that introduced the uh, revival of interest bearing debt to finance the warlords that it was setting against countries that would not permit uh, Roman financial and fiscal control of their economies. Uh, and so uh, <laughs> this was really the shaping, the force that had shaped the last thousand years of Western civilization. And uh, people, have, uh, economic historians, have left out the debt issue completely. They've talked about uh, monetary history, They've talked about uh, the growth of uh, uh, finance, but they haven't looked about how finance shaped the whole uh, uh, constitutions of governments uh, and uh, the radical cha uh, change that occurred in the uh, 17th century. I won't get into more details now because we're supposed to talk about the modern economy. But uh, uh, at any rate, uh, the, the reason for studying uh, the ancient Near East is uh, to say that co contrary to what Margaret Thatcher said, there is an alternative. Uh, the economy does not have to polarize. Uh, 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 letting the markets work their uh, magic does not have to lead to economic polarization and impoverishment. The, uh, it didn't do that for thousands and thousands of years. Other societies uh, created them. Western civilization has not. That's the difference between Western civilization and other civilizations. And uh, you're seeing that split uh, today, uh, this year. Uh, that's the whole split that's going on now between uh, the uh, the U.S. and the NATO countries and uh, China, Russia, and the BRICS plus country economies. Well, that's some sort of pricey, Michael. Thank you for that oversight. And I really do hope the progressive church movement is picking up on this incredible volume of work you keep producing. And uh, who knows, maybe even some uh, historians. But uh, back to the temples of enterprise, I just want to ask this last question before we get on to our Patreon's questions. Um, what was it about ancient Mesopotamia that led to its economic takeoff? You mentioned it had a need for foreign trade and that its temples and palaces organized this trade along with temple workshops to produce handicrafts for trade, and that this was the origin of commercial enterprise with the economy operating on credit. The, uh, uh, the, the There were two kinds of credit, uh, and they had different, uh, in their law, they had different world, words. There was commercial credit uh, that was denominated in silver by merchants who would uh, take the, uh, uh, the textiles 
and the other uh, handicraft works that Mesopotamia uh, produced. And what Mesopotamia needed was uh, stone and uh, metal uh, and things that were not available in its soil. Its soil was very rich, sort of like Ukraine soil. Uh, it was all deposited over the millennia by by uh, water, ba uh, basically, uh, coming in and, del and uh, uh, delivering rich, rich soil. But that soil, uh, because it was alluvial, didn't have metal or uh, wood, uh, hardwood, uh, or, or stone. And so all of that uh, the, uh, you needed, they call it the Bronze Age, but the bronze uh, required the organization of trade in order to get tin and copper to make the bronze. Uh, and silver uh, is sort of uh, a, a, a sanctified uh, metal that was used for uh, uh, church de uh, decorations and, and uh, prestige. Well, uh, Ukraine, uh, I'm sorry, uh, various uh, Sumerian cities like Uruk uh, had, there was a huge expansion and how was it going to get this uh, metal? Well, you couldn't just go out and conquer countries uh, and say, we're going to take over your mines because if you conquered them and we're talking about going hundreds of miles away, they'd fight back and it's very expensive to try to run an empire. So what they they had to do it by peaceful trade. Uh, and so the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, temples and the, the palace would encourage a uh, uh, entrepreneurial merchant class. Uh, to uh, take a consignment of uh, 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 wool or uh, weavings or clothes or carpets uh, to uh, these countries and to exchange them for metal and uh, uh, whatever uh, the Sumerians uh, needed. So, uh, you, uh, and in order to do this, you had to uh, the, the first market you had to create had to uh, operate in some kind of prices and weights. Uh, how are you going to, uh, if you're going to have silver, uh, how are you going to make sure that it's pure silver? Well, it wasn't really pure. It was uh, seven eight silver and it had to be alloyed. But uh, and how are you going to weigh it? So the market had to be created by a central administrative authority. Uh, you couldn't just uh, go to uh, say, well, give me a lump uh, of silver and we'll trade a lump for, um, you know, for uh, grain or, or, or uh, clothes or whatever you want. It had to be in a standardized uh, form. And the standardization, not only of weights and measures, but also of purity, uh, had to be sanctified uh, in order to be able to punish uh, counterfeiting as uns, uh, is a, a uh, violation of the sanctified social order. Well, all of the markets had to be created. There was no such thing as uh, the uh, Austrian myth of just free individuals saying, well, you know, I'm going to have some silver and I'm going to trade you in the market. Uh, if it weren't regulated, you, you would have fake silver, uh, you, it wouldn't be weighed, there, there would be just pure anarchy uh, and barter. And so you had to have an alternative uh, to this, and that had to be centrally administered, which is why every society in antiquity, from uh, Sumer to Babylonia to Greece to Rome, had produced their coinage or their, their monetary metal in the temples. That's why the word money comes from the Temple of Juno Moneta in Rome that that uh, uh, that minted uh, the coins during the uh, uh, Punic War. So uh, I I had to look at well uh, how did how did they create a system that was all interacting? And I realized that the what means of thought in Babylonia through the entire Near East, uh, if you're thinking of a policy, you have to think of how the whole economy interacts with each other. You look at the economy as a system. Well, that's what's lacking in economic analysis today. They don't look at the economy as a system, or if they do, they, it's a system that excludes debt, that excludes finance, that treats the whole system as if it works just on, on current exchange. There's no future. There's uh, no discussion of, well, what's going to happen when the system gets out of balance? How do we restore balance? This had to be the means of survival of any society or economy that is just taking off back in the third millennium, the second millennium, and the first millennium BC. 
And uh, that's why it's so important to see how other countries coped with these phenomena. Uh, how do you organize debt? Well, uh, how, what are the, uh, when does it have to be repaid? Uh, uh, you had, I talked about silver debt, but what about the, the debts of the population as a whole? Well, they weren't, the, were not denominated in silver. They were denominated in grain, or possibly you could say in wool, uh, which was a product because there was herding also, the, in addition to a uh, nomadic herding is addition to uh, uh, grain production. So uh, you, you, you had uh, a whole different uh, interest rate. You had different uh, loan conditions uh, for agriculture, uh, but all of the, uh, the uh, uh, agri agriculture sometimes has a uh, drought or sometimes the crops fail. What do you do when crops fail? And inevitably, you're going to have uh, years in which there's a drought or the, there's a flood or the crops fail. Well, the Babylonian laws of Hammurabi said, if the crops fail, uh, nobody has to pay the debt. Everybody, uh, most of the debts were owed to the palace or temples or their bureaucracy for advancing um, uh, inputs or food uh, or uh, mean uh, cattle uh, to the cultivators well uh, if if you ha ha the debts can't be paid because of a natural phenomenon then okay it's a bad loan uh, you go back to how it was before nobody you're not going to wreck society uh, and and debt the population on the land simply because uh, the crops failed. Uh, you you want society to be more important than uh, just uh, leaving it up to uh, the the risk of nature. So what the uh, the uh, Mesopotamians did was a means of handling risk in a way that it did not uh, destroy society uh, by uh, transferring property and labor and personal freedom to a creditor class. Well, that's not uh, all these uh, destructive tendencies are exactly what occurred in Rome and Greece and uh, uh, subsequent Europe and uh, the United States. That's how Western economies work. Excellent, Michael. Excellent. Uh, yeah, as we're uh, back in time, um, Carl Sanchez asks, um, how did the Chinese differ in development from West Asia back in those times? Wait, how did how did what China's economy? How was that evolving at, at a similar time scale to what you've been? I discussing? really don't. I, very, I know very little about uh, the Chinese economy. They they did not uh, place the merchant class on top. Uh, uh, mercantile trade was pretty much uh, looked down upon uh, throughout the entire world in every economy, all the way uh, to China, said, how are we going to prevent the merchant class uh, from really taking over? How do we keep it in its place? So there was always throughout uh, Asia, the whole society had an idea of maintaining social balance. And uh, that sort of social spirit uh, has become almost a, a national character, e even though there were many changes of government and uh, China went through the awful century of uh, uh, British uh, uh, domination and the o opium wars, that spirit of looking at society as a system and saying, we must maintain balance and avoid impoverishing the people. Uh, the uh, the whole basis of Chinese philosophy was you, you have to maintain a prosperous uh, a, peasantry and population uh, in order to uh, survive, to have an army to defend yourself so that uh, they, they have to be you know well-fed, well-clothed to be productive. You wanted the population to be productive, self-sustaining, and not uh, uh, reduced below basic living standards. There was a, a, a you, you looked at support of a business of living standards, having your own means of self support on the land, uh, your own housing, uh, your own basic needs, and including uh, health and various uh, things that uh, the government uh, or society uh, would supply. Uh, all of these were human rights. Uh, these human rights did not exist in the West. Uh, that's really the difference. Uh, th there are no human rights. They wanted a free market. The free market means uh, uh, basically you, you you kill everyone who who supports uh, human rights because that interferes with uh, the freedom of the wealthy to uh, do, as the Romans said, whatever they want 
with the poor. Sean Gosh um, asks, uh, the economic dynamics of debt forgiveness in the ancient Near East society sounds like the intent of Keynes' Bancor system that may form the basis of the BRICS settlement system. When applied to countries rather than human subjects, do we not have to spell out certain rules of behaviour for the participants, e.g. thou shalt not chronically try to consume more than thou produce? Are the set of such rules that lead to a stable, balanced world economy clear and available? The uh, the BRICS uh, countries, China and all the rest, are simply uh, they're now trying to reinvent the wheel uh, and uh, develop all this uh, debt. For, it's not really debt forgiveness. Uh, the word technical word that a, a theoriologist uses is debt remission. Uh, the the big question that the BRICS have is debt among countries. Uh, they're they're going to uh, the immediate. Task if they're going to have is uh, if you're going to have a reorganization of trade uh, between China, Russia, the BRICS, and they're not going to trade uh, with Europe and uh, America because um, Europe and America doesn't want to trade with them. Uh, it says it, it the the pretense uh, in America is that it's trade with China that is uh, de is bankrupted America and deindustrialized America. The reality is America has deindustrialized itself by uh, replacing industrial capitalism with finance capitalism. But uh, uh, the, what the uh, BRICS countries are doing, uh, if we're going to trade among ourselves, they're going to be imbalances. We're going to have to reorient it, uh, all the trade patterns that have developed and were based largely on trade with the United States and Europe is the most uh, the wealthiest part of the world. We're going to have to trade with each other and give up the European and American market. That means that uh, the country, the wealthy countries, are going to have to uh, 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 not necessarily. Uh, 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 null debts right away. But if it turns out that after 10 years or so, the uh, the countries that are uh, receiving uh, infrastructure development and tangible tangible investment, not financial loans, but tangible investments, uh, the, the, the debts will have to be canceled. And uh, this is and China and Russia, uh, uh, Iran have decided that it's worth having this. It's worth writing down the debts to countries that can't pay in order to have an international, a global system that is an uh, alternative to the NATO Western system. And uh, as long as the NATO Western system is militarily aggressive, and attacking, uh, it is simply a national uh, self-defense of uh, East Asia, China, to uh, uh, have to join together to create something of mutual aid. I think uh, in term, uh, that's what you should think of it as, in, in the sense uh, that even Calden uh, described, mutual aid. Uh, that's how uh, Calden said all of the great uh, civilizations have taken off by having in place a system of mutual aid instead of uh, 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 letting these systems uh, deteriorate or decay into an exploitive system of mutual exploitation and, and uh, antagonism instead of mutual aid. So uh, the, uh, the BRICS plus countries are now in the process of trying to create uh, an economic system of uh, uh, mutual aid written into uh, the laws of uh, how are you going to uh, transact trade in without dollars uh, into uh, another uh, alt uh, currency that uh, the will be centrally produced. You'll have their own kind of a central bank. In a way, it's very much like what John Maynard Keynes proposed uh, uh, back in uh, 1944 against uh, the American uh, designs for the International Monetary Fund, uh, the Bancor, uh, a system of credit. So they're trying to figure out what kind of, how are we going to decline, uh, define this new Bancor credit uh, for trade uh, between China, Russia, and the African countries, uh, Brazil, Latin American countries. How are we going to have a new international unit of trade? That's what's being developed this year. And will be developed next year when China replaces Russia as uh, uh, the head administrator of the BRICS. 
uh, Francis uh, Zott asks, uh, if, if it was somehow determined that the US's national debt was unable to be paid and therefore could not be paid, and as in antiquity that debt would be cancelled, how would that be done in the USA? Would the debt holders be able to take legal action to stop, to stop <laughs> such a decree? And why would force would that force all of the debt holders to be convinced to be left holding the bag? Thanks for your attention, Francis. The United States uh, can always pay its debts because its debts are in dollars. Uh, if you're uh, Argentina, you can't pay your debts because... Uh, your debts are in dollars and you can't print the dollars. Uh, America can always say, of course, we can pay the debts. Here are the dollars. And they'll say, well, you know what? Uh, uh, we want you to repay uh, the bond that we have. And the Americans will say, sure, say, sell it on the market. Or you know, if it's matured, cash it in and we'll give you the, the dollars for it here. Now you have a bank account in dollars. Uh, so uh, it doesn't have to write down the debt, but what it will do is say, uh, if we're uh, at war uh, with a with a uh, if we're at war with a country that's not a democracy, like like uh, Ukraine is a democracy and uh, uh, Israel is a democracy, if you're not a country with a democracy willing to uh, uh, basically follow orders uh, from Washington, then uh, we'll create we'll do what we did to Russia. We'll just seize your we'll, uh, seize. Uh, the debt you have in uh, in American banks, or your, uh, our satellite European banks, and we'll just cancel it. Uh, the uh, especially, let's say, your uh, Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia says, "Well, you know, we've just joined BRICS, uh, and uh, we're going to support uh, uh, the, uh, our Arab uh, uh, brothers and trying to get the United States out of uh, uh, the Near East because you're uh, bombing our people. You're taking, uh, you know, you're you're genocidists uh, in the West. That's what." Christianity is, uh, basically. That's what your Judeo-Christianity is. And uh, uh, we don't want that. So uh, we're selling our uh, treasury bills and the stocks and bonds that we have in America. We're going to buy gold or we're going to buy uh, assets uh, outside of the dollar uh, area. Well, the United States will say, well, we told you back in uh, 1974, that uh, you could charge whatever uh, you wanted for your oil. You can make as much money as you want on your oil. But if you don't turn over all your uh, oil earnings and keep send them to the U.S. economy to hold uh, government bonds or buy U.S. stocks, uh, that's an act of war. Well, you're, we're at war with you now. We're just going to cancel all of your holdings of stocks, bonds, and uh, governments. Uh, that's, uh, th that's not a debt cancellation. That's just a confiscation. Confiscation is different from a debt cancellation. Uh, that's how you should think of uh, uh, what uh, what America will do. And especially uh, now, uh, if the uh, BRICS countries say, well, we cannot develop our economies uh, w as long as we have all these dollar debts that uh, we incurred by making the mistake of trusting the West, trusting the IMF, trusting the World Bank to help us develop, to pay it off. That was all a lie. That was all junk economics. And yet they not only did they uh, convince our government for junk, junk economics, but if we had a government that didn't follow this, they overthrew them. They had a coup d'etat and a regime change. These debts are odious debts and we're not going to repay them. Well, uh, the United States was going to say, well, OK, uh, you don't pay the debts you owe to uh, dollar bondholders. We're going to just confiscate to, uh, do to you what we did to Venezuela. We'll confiscate uh, all the assets you own in the United States and Europe. So there's going to be a, a separation really into two civilizations, uh, the Western dollarized civilization trading among itself as it uh, winds down, and uh, the rest of the world's 85% global majority that's trying to actually grow uh, and uh, uh, develop in in the face of uh, global warming and all of the other problems that we have. Carlo Sanzella asks, could an eventual post Milli Argentina be fixed by applying MMT? Wait, could a post-Argentina... Tina, uh, I, the, the new leader, I'm not sure I'm saying his name right, uh, Milai. 
M I L A I. Nothing. It's it 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 is an anarchist. It's it's going to be pure, pure anarchy, uh, and uh, the idea of trying to redollarize the Argentinian economy will be that the uh, economy, the government, is not able to create the money to finance its own infrastructure development, its education, its health care, its roads, uh, and uh, all of the other things that are basically public uh, uh, and uh, part of the natural public sector. And uh, the Argentina economy will uh, collapse internally, just like it did last time it tried to dollarize the economy. OK. Um... Jesse Boyd asks, uh, Michael, great to see you. I see you've been working with Jill Stein. What do you think of the Greens? Can they really change the system while working within it? Should we be voting for Greens or overturning the system? I worry the Greens everywhere tend to subvert revolutionary fervor and change. Change I don't it think into there's, uh, revolutionary fer uh, fervor in the United States now. You could, the United States is what uh, Lenin would have called a pre revolutionary situation. And Lenin always uh, warned against uh, naive, uh, premature trying to uh, change uh, an uh, uh, ec economy or political system where uh, you just uh, were too marginal uh, to have an effect. Uh, the the way I think the way of changing the United States will be uh, to watch itself uh, continue to deindustrialize and polarize while it sees that there is another system in the world. They'll they'll say why why is China growing and getting more and more uh, prosperous while we're getting poorer and poorer? What is it doing that we're not doing? There has to be a change of consciousness uh, in the economy as a whole before there can be a revolution from outside. And ironically, as it seems, most of the uh, reform movements all the way from the first millennium on when you had private uh, wealth developed, if you look at who were the uh, uh, biblical, uh, the, uh, the uh, Judaic uh, uh, prophets, they were, uh, they were not uh, outsiders, they were pretty well, uh, uh, well-situated, uh, prosperous uh, individuals. You had to be prosperous uh, uh, in the 7th or 6th or 5th century uh, in order to, BC, uh, in order to have uh, be able to de develop uh, a, a, whole, a whole alternative uh, doctrine. Uh, there, uh, there's not uh, that kind of a reform movement uh, in the West, in the United States or in the West. Uh, the wealthy uh, system from which used to be the reformers are all in Davos with the World Economic Forum. I don't think uh, Jill Stein has uh, any uh, wealthy billionaire uh, backing her party. Uh, she is uh, her campaign is probably uh, the last one uh, that you can imagine uh, in American history that uh, actually is funded by small donations. Uh, and uh, uh, in order for uh, her even to have a the role of a spoiler, I mean, there is uh, she has to get on the balance and the Democratic Party. Uh, along with the Republicans, but mainly the Democrats, uh, have tried to make sure that uh, no third party can get on uh, the ballot at all. Uh, the uh, RFK Jr. Uh, has made uh, many signatures pretending to be Jill Stein, uh, pretending to uh, ha all his, his uh, uh, signature ballots when, do you support a third party? And um, my, the people who signed for RFK said, of course, we... Uh, support a third party. They're thinking of Jill Stein, but uh, he covered up. There was no indication. Uh, it was all false pretenses that he did. And uh, uh, he was able to get uh, these signatures. But uh, he had a billionaire uh, uh, supporter, uh, uh, multi-billionaire uh, supporting him. Uh, Jill Stein uh, uh, has to spend her time campaigning locally, going around largely New York, uh, but also other uh, states to try to mobilize uh, people, uh, raise money on a fairly small scale just to get the signatures that is getting her on the ballot. Well, what if she gets on the ballot and she for, she pulls maybe 7% of the vote? That's my aim is for her to get 7%. 
uh, and that will uh, deny the Republicans and uh, or uh, either Trump or Biden uh, the uh, automatic presidency. It's all going to go into the House of Representatives at that point. The, uh, I think Jill Stein and I agree that there cannot be progress in the United States without destroying the Democratic Party as uh, the uh, the ultra right wing uh, political uh, for, uh, form, uh, the, the militarist group, uh, the uh, the financial group, basically uh, the Wall Street uh, billionaires. Uh, and uh, the military industrial complex. Uh, you, 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 even if it costs uh, supporting a Republican, uh, you, you've got to get rid of the, uh, uh, Demo the Democratic Party as controlled by the uh, National Committee. Uh, the, uh, uh, legally, the Democratic Party doesn't have to pay attention to who's elected at all or who's nominated. Uh, it's It's all set in, in a small room of a small group of uh, committee men that represent the military industrial, uh, uh, military industry, the banking sector, uh, Wall Street, uh, and the oil industry. So uh, that w if it's thrown into Congress, this will be a turmoil where uh, probably neither Biden nor Trump will be uh, elected unless a lot of uh, re so-called uh, progressive Republicans, if that's not an oxymoron, uh, join uh, the Democrats in uh, supporting some uh, some other candidate. Well, uh, they they still can't do it uh, without uh, Jill Stein saying, "Well, uh, if you're going to want my support in a coalition government, here here are the reforms uh, that we want." That's what we're that's what we're playing for. We're not expecting to uh, uh, become uh, president and redesign the economy because to do that you'd need the whole you need the Congress, you'd need the Senate, you'd need the Supreme Court, and uh, uh, you can only have that uh, action at the margin uh, uh, as sort of a campaign just to show yes there is an alternative. And that's uh, her basic campaign to show that there is an alternative, uh, but the uh, the uh, duopoly between the Republicans and the Democratic Party are blocking such an alternative today. It's just such a tragedy. America has first passed the post uh, voting systems alongside Canada and the UK. Um, if if only preferential voting was was part of the system, is there any movement um, of of note in that space? None whatsoever. Uh, and the problem is really the American Constitution. Uh, the Constitution was written by, by slave owners with the purpose of uh, 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 preventing any movement to free the slaves. That was the number one concern that shaped the Constitution. And the, the, the way that they did that was to restrict federal power and uh, have state, uh, state power. That's why all the slave owners supported state power and why the anti-abortion uh, uh, groups today say, well, we want the state rights. Uh, the federal government can't uh, uh, provide, uh, 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 provide uh, say that everybody has a right to abortion. Every state has a right uh, to treat, uh, to ban abortions, just as uh, every state used to have the role to uh, defend slave, promote slavery, and uh, oppose uh, abolition. This is uh, this prevention of any national uh, ability to reform through the government. When uh, Biden tried to cancel student debts, uh, the case went uh, uh, to the higher courts, and the court said, uh, "No, the federal government has no right to uh, cancel student debts because that would uh, hurt." So, uh, some of the states oppose it. Uh, any state can say, well, uh, we insist in not uh, forgiving student debts. So you, you have the whole Constitution blocking uh, economic progress and blocking socialism in a way. Not only socialism, but uh, what used to be called uh, industrial capitalism. There, it, it blocks any uh, reform policy coming from the government. So what's needed is a constitutional convention. And uh, the, the right-wingers, Wall Street, the oil industry, the military industrial uh, complex have spent 30 years 
trying to define, let's make a new constitution, and it'll be just as rotten as uh, the Roman constitution was uh, in uh, preventing democracy. Uh, the the only people who have discussed constitutional reform are saying, how can we lock in an oligarchy so that it can never be challenged by any kind of democratic underclass? Uh, that's uh, what's uh, locked the United States into the uh, political uh, tunnel vision uh, that it has, and to pre uh, it essentially prevents it from avoiding continual deindustrialization and economic polarization. John Douglas uh, says, thank you for your time, Michael. I have Temples of Enterprise at home, along with most of your other books. I'm reading Pollyanni's Gr The Great Transformation right now off your recommendation. I'm really digging it. Is there a good follow-up you could recommend? Also, when did you first read it and what impression did it leave on you? Well, I want to know what impression uh, for uh, I'd be one thing I'd like to know from the listeners is of the people who've read that book or my other book, what, what's your reaction to it? Uh, what do you get out of it? Uh, I, I'm I'm curious uh, to know. And in terms of uh, what you do for a follow up, well, the follow up would be uh, the uh, the collapse of antiquity. Uh, basically, that's uh, what uh, what happened after uh, uh, temples of enterprise uh, and the Mesopotamian takeoff. Uh, nobody that I, it's amazing to me that there is no group that is studying the, uh, uh, the political evolution of society from the vantage point of how has it treated the debt dynamic. Uh, as I told you, they talk about monetary history, you know, how much did, uh, uh, the, the coins weigh and how much silver did it have or gold. Uh, they'll have financial history. What did the bank? How did you have banking? But there's nothing about uh, what are the political impact of debt, and how did the way in which how did the creditors end up gaining control of government to shape governments uh, in uh, a pro-creditor way? In order, and the answer is uh, they did it, and uh, the governments uh, wanted to get the money to wage war on each other's, uh, so that. Uh, uh, Catholics could fight uh, uh, Protestants uh, and uh, the royalty could all do what royalty does, go to war with their neighbors and try to conquer their uh, uh, their systems. They all needed to raise money and that meant they had to redesign uh, the whole state. The, the modern state uh, emerged in the 17th and late 17th and 18th century as a means of uh, uh, committing the entire economy to pay the creditors for the war debts that they were uh, taking up. Uh, before uh, the uh, 17th and 18th century, uh, debts, uh, national debts or, were royal debts. And uh, the the king might uh, owe the debts. So the king of Spain, the king of England, they, that would depend on the royal domain, which uh, was shrinking and shrinking as they sold it off to pay the debts uh, or their power to tax, uh, which uh, was uh, uh, weakening as you had domestic parliaments uh, fighting back against the royal power to tax, uh, like you, you had in 1215 with the uh, Magna Carta. Uh, and uh, the uh, you had a whole transformation of the state by creditors in order uh, so that states could borrow and lock in their debts and avoid uh, having the debts wiped out, which would happen in uh, national bankruptcies, such as uh, the Spanish bankruptcies uh, of the uh, 16th and 17th centuries. I think uh, John Douglas was talking about um, Pollyanni's book, The Great Transformation. Um, when did you first read it and what impression did it leave on you and what would you recommend as a follow-up book for him well, to I, read after Pollyanni? I liked the book when I read it. And in a matter of fact, our, our group was the successor of uh, uh, the Polanyi group. Uh, Polanyi worked uh, through Columbia University and uh, we had our, thir our third uh, Harvard Colloquium 
on uh, essentially de uh, debt and economic renewal in the ancient Near East was uh, held at Columbia. Uh, and we were, uh, well, certainly uh, Polanyi's daughter, Carrie Polanyi, uh, has uh, viewed our group as uh, going uh, beyond uh, uh, following uh, the tradition uh, of uh, Polanyi, who was a uh, Hungarian uh, uh, socialist in, uh, in uh, Vienna, fighting against the uh, Austrian uh, reactionaries uh, and right wing. Uh, and uh, he did not focus uh, particularly on uh, debt cancellation, but uh, Kerry and uh, uh, her co-editor, Radhika Desai, uh, published a whole sort of uh, final uh, memorial volume of uh, uh, <coughs> Errol Polanyi uh, a few years ago, and uh, I have uh, the article on uh, on money uh, and uh, Polanyi's treatment of money and uh, how that uh, how uh, our group is uh, uh, built on that treatment. So Polanyi was certainly a step in the direction where uh, our Harvard group uh, uh, has taken off on. So yes, uh, it's always good to sit, trace uh, the backing, uh, but also just to trace uh, the history of uh, the nineteenth century and economic history. Uh, you could begin almost anywhere. Certainly, Polanyi and <coughs> his group are uh, are very helpful. Although uh, the the research that they did has been very largely superseded in the last uh, ha half century or seventy five years. <coughs> Sorry, I, I I tend to imagine that I have to talk loud over a microphone. Uh you're sounding good, Michael. Uh, we have a question on uh, the financial markets basically seem to be going sideways. What do you think is propping them up at this time? I work in the financial <laughs> sector and every economist I listen to seems to be favoring a soft landing or a higher for longer type scenario. Do you have any opinion about what the trigger for a downturn could be? Well, uh this is what I'd uh, I wanted you to ask a question, and uh, I'll give an example uh, to uh, what happened today in New York. Uh, uh, today, uh, the, uh, the there had been plans for the last few years to introduce today con congestion pricing uh, in New York. In other words, cars that came into Manhattan uh, were going to have to pay fifteen dollars to get into the uh, the central city, uh, the very center of it. Uh, where all the pollution occurs, it take it used to it has taken me fifty minutes to get a, just the two miles uh, across Manhattan uh, in Midtown, and uh, the uh, New York is a very polluted uh, polluted city, and uh, uh, Governor uh, Hochul uh, had promised to uh, support uh, the congestion pricing, uh, but then she changed her mind. She said, uh, she said, look, I've talked to the lobbyists and, uh, we, we, we got to cancel, uh, congestion pricing because a congestion pricing would make it more expensive for automobiles to get into, uh, the, uh, off the, bring the workers into the offices. And if they're not workers in the offices, if, uh, the workers say, well, instead of paying $15 uh, to add to our uh, daily transport, uh, weekday transportation to get to work. We'd rather work for home. Well, that means uh, all already in New York City, uh, the uh, there is a forty percent vacancy rate in commercial office buildings. Well, just imagine with congesting pricing, if this goes even lower, uh, uh, the mortgages on uh, all of these. Uh, uh, many many office buildings in New York are falling due this year next year in 2026 there's about to be tr uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of defaults on these uh, mortgages and so uh Hochschild said well uh in uh, <clears throat> the purpose of in uh this congestion pricing was uh to raise a billion dollars to save the subway system from uh, the decay that it's had because uh, uh, the subway's uh, Metropolitan Transit Authority spent all the money on uh, developing uh, stations in the wealthy neighborhoods of the Upper uh, East Side in New York City, not on the rest uh, of, uh, uh, of Queens, uh, uh, Brooklyn, uh, Staten Island. And uh, today for, uh, I had to take uh, at noon, uh, I came back from Manhattan to where I live in Forest Hills at one o'clock p.m. 
Uh, the train was at standing room only, absolutely packed on the E train. <clears throat> Uh, and it was also packed, uh, the homeless situation. Uh, uh, America does have a po homeless policy. It's sleep, sleep in the subways. Uh, so that there were people sort of stretched out over whole, uh, whole chairs there. Well, uh, the mayor of New York uh, uh, was elected after serving on the board of directors of Citibank. Uh, and he applauded Hochul's uh, cancellation of uh, uh, the congestion pricing. Uh, and by saying, you know, this would be a disaster, uh, be, be a disaster for the banks. What's more important, transporting New Yorkers to work or saving the banks? Well, the banks are the most important thing because they're my campaign contributors. They're who I work for. He didn't say that. Uh, I'm sort of translating the subtext uh, of what the uh, what he was saying. Uh, and so uh, the uh, you're going to have uh, essentially uh, New York's environment uh, polluted and uh, spurring the emigration of labor from New York. People are not living in Manhattan. The average rent in Manhattan now average is forty five hundred dollars a month. Well, you can imagine why uh, New York is long no longer uh, the financial center, uh, the industrial center. It used to be, you know, seventy five years ago, uh, it was an industrial economy. Uh, all electronics, uh, uh, dairies, all sorts of things. All of that has been gentrified now uh, and uh, uh, dr driven out. Uh, so uh, the, the the question was, is there going to be a crash? Well, uh, the, the the crash uh, is probably going to be uh, on real estate debt, starting with uh, commercial uh, real estate and uh, spreading to uh, domestic uh, uh, to uh, or, uh, personal uh, family uh, 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 real estate. That's that's the weak part of the system. Also uh, threatening the uh, solvency of banks is uh, third world uh, debt repudiation, saying we can't afford to pay the debts. Uh, that's going to uh, upset things. Finally, the, the insurance industry uh, is now uh, stopping insurance basically in Florida and the whole Midwestern <clears throat> tornado uh, system. Uh, the, the costs of insurance are vastly increasing. The cost of pr uh, the, the price of uh, living in a home that you own uh, that's going to lead to uh, uh, debt arrears. You're having in the United States arrear, debt arrears going up for everything. Uh, student loan debt arrears up. Credit card debt arrears up. Uh, automobile debt arrears up. Uh, all these entail uh, penal penalty uh, rates that are higher than the interest rates. Uh, and you're having uh, the whole economy basically uh, impoverished by uh, the debt overhead. Uh, which again, uh, only uh, Jill Stein's campaign uh, is is talking about. Uh, the economists are not talking about it. You have uh, political hacks like Paul Krugman uh, saying, "Why I don't understand why uh, American uh, Americans uh, in uh, when their polls say the economy isn't doing well." Look, he, uh, Biden has cured inflation. Well, who gives a damn is if, infl if he's cured inflation, the economy is doing great. Look at all the billionaires that are being created. We have to be doing great or we wouldn't create so many billionaires. I, uh, imagine this. Uh, he doesn't re Why are people saying the economy is lousy? It's lousy because they can't afford to live without going deeper into debt. They can't afford to break even and buy the essentials without running into credit card debt or taking out a uh, equity loan against uh, their house, uh, putting their house even more deeply uh, in debt. Uh, they're they're living, uh, trying to break even on credit and they're falling further and further behind. And Krugman says, debt doesn't matter because we owe it to ourselves. So it all ends up in zero. That's net, there's no net debt. The debtors uh, uh, owe to, uh, to the creditors and uh, uh, that it's, it's, it's a wash. Uh, you, you have uh, the economic curriculum does not dis discuss a debt. As I said, uh, you have to go back to uh, Babylonian Babylonia uh, to look at uh, when the debt dynamics are really uh, uh, described. So the economy is driving blind by not looking at the debt issue that is leading to the defaults and the break in the chain of payments that is uh, leading to the uh, problems uh, that will, uh, at a certain point, uh, uh, cause 
a crash. Uh, nobody I know can explain why the stock market is going up so much, uh, except that it's uh, pri the enormous amount of private capital uh, that was accumulated uh, in the wake of uh, Obama's uh, bank bailouts. Uh, there, uh, since 2008, almost all the growth in wealth has accrued just to the 1% of the population. I'd say 80% of the growth in the wealth all centered at the top and there's so much money that they're buying out company they're buying out whole companies by buying buying the stock so uh the stock market booming is not a sense of health it's it's a re, it's a reflection of the polarization and the inequality uh, uh, uh and the takeover of uh the uh, industry and uh, the entire uh, real estate agriculture uh, by as a result of the wealth that was led to develop uh, essentially by not doing what Nicholas Arismond said in the, the 16th century uh, you better ex you better drive all the uh, wealthy people out of the country or the city his point of view was a city back then but right now uh, America is letting a wealthy class develop and uh, the wealthy class, uh, does not seek to develop the economy as a whole, but to make money for itself by impoverishing the economy as a whole. So America's idea of wealth is to impoverish the economy. It's the poverty that uh, creates the wealth at the top. The poverty of debt creates the creditor wealth at the top. It's all a, uh, an economic system. You'd think what this would be what uh, economic models are all about, but uh, uh, that's not what they give Nobel Prizes for. Um, some great stuff going on in the chat here. And Diana, who's been uh, leading the way there, firing in too much stuff for me to, to decipher. But she says, I wish I could buy Michael dinner and listen to him all night long. Uh, Michael, uh, yeah, I'd love to see you out to dinner with some of your Patreons. It'd be a fascinating discussion. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm afraid of COVID. I, I've stopped going out uh, to restaurants uh, because uh, of the COVID uh, spread. So I haven't, uh, my wife and I haven't gone out uh, for dinner really since uh, uh, early 2020. So uh, not dinner. It has to be, it can be Zoom meetings, uh, but I'm not, I haven't gone on an airplane. I haven't, I have even stopped going to China uh, and do all of my, I'm doing everything in China uh, on Zoom uh, instead of uh uh, flying back and forth as I was before. Francis Zott asks another good question. If the USA is headed for an economic disaster, is gold a viable hedge for individuals? What other actions can be attempted to cushion the future problems that the USA and its vassals will be facing? Foreign stocks, any suggestions? Uh, uh, if you think the West is uh, uh, collapsing, then where are you going to emigrate to? Uh, I was told uh, that I have a green card in China if I want, uh, but uh, I'm probably I'm going to stay here because this is where uh, this is uh, where I know uh, I know everybody. It's it's my my uh, uh, my society. So I don't know uh, what there really isn't any any safety in if the world's getting uh, unsafe. I mean, look at the threats of atomic war now. I think uh, the United States, uh, uh, the uh, the Biden administration has made a calculation. Uh, I think they agree with my analysis. They say, yes, the West is going down and China and Russia are going out. Now, that means that uh, uh, if, if we don't bomb them now and go to war with them now, a year later, they're going to be even stronger and we'll be poor. And 10 years later, they'll be much stronger and we'll be poor. If we're going to atom bomb the world, let, uh, we'd better do it now. It's never There's never going to be as good a time to go to war as now. And uh, they're trying to do everything they can to provoke Russia and China uh, into the war. This is uh, why the Democratic Party is evil. Uh, and Biden is uh, the embodiment of evil. Uh, and uh, along with uh, uh, Secretary of State Blinken and uh, uh, Sullivan, uh, th these people are should be treated as war criminals. They should be shunned. And yet there's no uh, revulsion in the United States uh, against uh, against uh, them and uh, their, uh, what they're doing. They want war. 
uh, they've, they've made a commitment to it. Uh, the uh, Global Economic Forum in, in Switzerland has, uh, says uh, you need war because the world's overpopulated. Uh, if we don't have war, at least we can spread uh, disease, global warming, and that's going to wipe out uh, much of the population that's living uh, on uh, the seashore, so Bangladesh, uh, uh, Miami. Uh, all of that. We, we, uh, they really want to cut down the population, and they think that war or disease or uh, everything that the Book of Revelation talks about uh, uh, is uh, the solution, not a disaster. Uh, Dina Lebowitz asks on behalf of Flora, I've been studying FDR-era Secretary of Labor, Frances Perkins, and her role in the New Deal. She studied with Wharton professor Simon Patton, who studied econ in Germany in the 1870s, 80s, before getting her MA at Columbia University in econ and sociology in 1910. Any comments on what, besides pulling the country out of depression, she was trying to accomplish? Was she trying to move the USA economy closer to, to the German model? Yes, that's exactly uh, my uh, 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 killing the host has a long uh, chapter on that. Yes, that's exactly what was happening. Simon Patton uh, uh, had been educated in Germany. All the Almost all the founders of the American Economic Association uh, in the uh, 1880s had studied uh, in Germany. Uh, the, the whole idea of the economic model was the German economic model. Uh, the uh, uh, American officials who were studying uh, productivity, uh, in the government uh, were uh, German emigres. Uh, the uh, education system uh, was uh, developed uh, by a German. Uh, yes, uh, they were very explicitly following the, the model, and Patton was uh, trying to do that and uh, decided uh, what he found was that uh, the uh, free traders uh, were uh, so uh, hopelessly narrow-minded and the, we we know where they ended up with the Chicago School and people like Krugman. Uh, that uh, he said uh, he didn't want to call it economics anymore. He founded the Sociology Association. He said we've got to talk about so, uh, sociology. We've got to put economics in an overall social context to think of it as a system. Uh, and that's what anthropology was supposed to be too. Uh, before Chicago. University of Chicago did to sociology and anthropology what it had done to economics and made it uh, tunnel visioned and just a study of status uh, instead of long term how uh, societies evolve. Right. Sorry, I've got a massive cramp going on here. Um, Carl Sanchez says there needs to be a new branch of study, political anthropology. Yes, the anthropology is the study of man, meaning man society. Uh, forgive the sexism, anthropo, uh, there. Uh, and it was a study. It was a study of the whole. Uh, how is a whole society evolving together? And you can't just look at the market. You look at the political system that shapes markets. Uh, you look at the political system that determines who is in charge of shaping the market. Uh, and in, in whose interest. Uh, anthropology originally was uh, developed uh, to do that. Uh, that's what I was trying to do uh, at, at Harvard in the, uh, the Peabody Museum, uh, where I was associated with and which uh, had uh, sponsored uh, all of the volumes of our, uh, uh, our colloquia on uh, how money developed, how re uh, land tenure uh, and uh, real estate uh, developed, how uh, de uh, debt and debt cancellation developed, how economic accounting developed, and uh, how uh, labor uh, evolved. Uh, Patreons, uh, Michael asked an important question earlier that uh, he, he would be interested in in what your the impact of any of his books has done um on your thinking so if anyone wants to raise their hand virginia will bring you up on the screen and you can talk with michael because uh always good um uh getting that prompting uh michael you really enjoy uh that feedback so that's, um, what I, that's what i thought these things were supposed to be i thought these meetings would be back and forth and there would be uh uh some kind of feedback not just me uh pontificating here we go. Carl Sanchez has raised his hand. 
Um, so hopefully Virginia can get someone up. Always more fun yeah. when others come on screen. Yep, I just promoted him to panelist. What? Okay, he's getting his camera organized, hopefully, and he'll come on board um, in just a second. That's good. Maybe another question while he's doing that. It takes a while. Yeah, that's it. Um, how do you see Victor Orban, Hungary's PM? Is he doing anything? Um, Victor Orban, how do you see him as a, a prime minister in Hungary? Wonderful. He's a very realistic. He's a... Uh, 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 I'm I'm waiting for him to withdraw from NATO and uh, join the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, he's he's uh, very very well uh, uh, balanced and uh, not a neoliberal, uh, and doesn't want to sacrifice his economy in the crazy war uh, in Ukraine. Uh, my friend Steve Keen uh, was just working uh, in Budapest at the central bank uh, for two or three months uh, this summer. I know just uh, this winter, I guess, your summer. He mm. uh, has uh, glowing reports of how, how well things work in Budapest. Matthew Connors um, asks, uh, this is a side note of a question, but I'm curious if Michael's familiar with uh, Chinu Achebe's Things Fall Apart. The main character's father was a debtor and the Igbo culture so well presented in his novels that has very interesting things to say about wealth and debt. Yes, uh, it was long. Uh, I, I, I've forgotten it now, uh, uh, so I, I, I can't comment specific. But yes, that's a, I remember that. I thought that was a good book. Um, Carl, we have we have two people up on camera. Now, do I just have to remove Michael's spotlight so that they can sure. be? I know what I look no, like. They, I uh, they can speak just as I am, I think. So let's start off with Carl. Um, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I want to go ahead and say thanks to Michael Hudson for redirecting my historical studies. Wait, who is this? This is Carl Sanchez. Oh, yeah, that's what I thought. You were, that's what it sounded like. <laughs> that's so am I am I coming through loud enough there? Okay, so I guess what, so maybe not. What's the yeah, question? You are here, um, Carl. Uh, Michael, maybe you need to turn up the volume on your computer. No, the volume's okay. It's like it's in a tin can. I can turn up the volume here. Uh, <laughs> I'm it, in a tin can. Oh, okay. Uh, what I was going to say there is, I just want to go ahead and thank you for changing my historical direction. My, the study of my uh, that I had embarked on historically was to go ahead and primarily focus on the New Deal and the Depression era to go ahead and and, uh, and dig into that because it was a transformative era. And uh, but in reading your uh, first of your super imperialism and then uh, other books after that, uh, I got into the idea of well. I, I want to go ahead and discover why it is we're, why we're at the way we are now. What caused us to become what we are today? Why the neoliberal empire of today? Well, the, you know, the New the, Deal. Why, was... the outlaw, uh, why the outlaw U.S. empire today? So uh, mm -hmm. your, your books that trace the, the rise of uh, the, the initial... Uh, uh, reaction to the classical economists in the 1880s was really key because that told me that aha, uh -huh, that's that's where the 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 change came because of uh, what was happening in Europe. The English changed their system, their way of doing it, and that infiltrated across the ocean and uh, changed the way that the the overall political economy of the United States changed with. The, the rise of Woodrow Wilson and World War I and all the subsequent stuff after that. So uh, your, your scholarship led to my change in my scholarship direction and my researches. And uh, uh, so today, I, what do I do today? Well, I'm focused a lot on contemporary events because of what I see happening in Russia and the Russian economic development. So I've been doing a lot of that and focusing on that. And you know that because you read my, my sub stack. 
So uh, it's like what Putin said to the, the heads of the uh, uh, world media yesterday when in uh, St. Petersburg, he told them that, uh, you know, matter of factly, that the U.S. was destroying its own financial system. He, he said that point blank to everybody there. He said the U.S. dollar, you know, Biden is, is and his policies are destroying the system here. And he thinks that they're doing that on purpose. Yes. Which was very interesting, you know, to, for him to go ahead and, and, and make that. Uh, it wasn't really a speculation. I think it was more being more matter of fact in his declaration there to, to the uh, uh, the media heads there. So uh, that, that was one of the interesting revelations of that. Uh, so if we have a system now where the, and you speculated on, on you know, what, now, Biden wants to maybe go to war now. Well, uh, I don't think that that's going to be very <laughs> good for the U.S. because we don't have any weapons that can beat the Russians. Uh, so uh, the the point was is that you know um, you wanted to get feedback on you know the effect of your scholarship on on your on readers on us, and uh, it's. I would just let you know that it's certainly had a profound impact on what uh, my academic direction uh, took. And uh, I've been a ceaseless promoter of all your works. Uh, and, uh, and it was one of the, you know, well, as soon as you went on the Patreon and wanted to get promotion, wanted to get support, I was one of the first people who signed up. So uh, here's to us. And I, I, I understand you're not wanting to leave New York. That's quite all right. Maybe I'll make it out there one of these days. Well, th thank you, Carol. I certainly, uh, uh, all of your work has paid off very well in providing the tra uh, translations that you do uh, on your substack. Sub I always look forward to reading it. And uh, certainly your, uh, what you wrote today, your your summary of uh, uh, President Putin's comments are very valuable. Uh, you begin by mentioning the New Deal. And what made the New Deal possible was it occurred in a crisis. And uh, Rose, uh, certainly the socialists all said uh, Roosevelt saved capitalism. Uh, and uh, he it took a crisis to enable him to put in place the uh, Agricultural Development Act that was the basis of, uh, of creating the, the largest increase in farm productivity and of any industry in history. Uh, he put together all sorts of uh, social uh, protection uh, agencies, uh, which are now uh, being dismantled. Uh, and uh, what uh, Putin has done in Russia in redesigning it was also the result of the crisis that the neoliberals had uh, created uh, through the uh, medium of Boris w Boris Yeltsin. By the way, and you know, I'm thinking today. I thought the other day, how do we think of the role of uh, Biden? Uh, is is Biden America's Boris Yeltsin, uh, destroying uh, the economy? Uh, I think the crisis we're going through today is very different from that of uh, that uh, uh, under Roosevelt or under uh, Putin, because uh, under Biden and the Democrats today, the crisis is being used uh, not to revive the economy, not to reform it by putting in place social protections and mutual aid, but to lock in uh, uh, Wall Street control and military control of the government, essentially to replace uh, elected government with uh, Wall Street and the military. Uh, along with uh, some of the uh, leading monopolies, uh, it's a, uh, the, the billionaires. Somehow they're recreating in America, uh, All uh, they're using the crisis to uh, create all of the worst characteristics of uh, the Roman Empire. Uh, so uh, that that's uh, the big difference. And the reason it's worthwhile reading the uh, reports of uh, the interviews by uh, uh, President Putin or uh, uh, Prime Minister, uh, Sec uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, which are just so wonderful, is uh, you realize that you know here they're they're in the process of creating a more uh, uh, successful uh, so society 
just like Roosevelt tried to do uh, in uh, the New Deal. You're seeing it actually being uh, created as they explain just exactly what they're doing and exactly uh, how uh, their policies, uh, uh, not only Russia, but China and the BRICS, are different from uh, the neoliberal policies uh, of the West. And uh, 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 since there isn't any policy yet of domestic reform of the U.S. economy, at least uh, you can watch how uh, the Russian economy is dealing with uh, the crisis left caused by neoliberalism for itself uh, and how China is dealing with uh, what really was a uh, carryover of neoliberalism in the way in which it's financed its uh, 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 real estate sector and uh, uh, the uh, local provincial and uh, lo local financing as opposed to federal financing. So you're seeing a, a new uh, alternative society uh, being created, and that, that's the virtue of watching uh, what's what's happening in these uh, uh, these uh, developments. And certainly, uh, the Russians are more explicit in explaining what they're doing than uh, I think that even the Chinese or others. Uh, and uh, you, you you can just see exactly why the world is splitting into two different. You could almost say two different civilizations, or whether civilization is being rescued from the detour that Western civilization took uh, two thousand years ago. So uh, yes, uh, I think uh, it, it is necessary. That's where what uh, you said anthropology comes in. You have to look at economics on the civilizational level, and if you do that, you see that there are so many different ways of dealing with the economic and financial tensions that are tearing the American society apart, uh, that it doesn't have to be this way. Yep. Definitely does not have to be this way. Thank you. Uh, and the, the, the Russians are, it's, they're, so, they're very transparent. Uh, they're, it's, and, and it's not just communication to their people. You know, they're doing as much of this stuff as possible to go ahead and communicate it to everybody else. Yep. And, um, and from, uh, I think it can be distilled down to, to this was pretty simple. And he said this, uh, several times in his talk yesterday and yep. that it's all about the promoting of people's interests and satisfying the interests of, you know, the, you know, everybody, the common people. The, the citizens of the countries versus the you know the satisfying those of the 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 oligarchs and the 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 top 10 percent just a small segment of society so it's uh i call it people-centered development but there's you know it could be called a form of socialism or something like that too but uh labels are one thing it's the results of what's being done is what you know matters in the long term so uh, we continue to watch and, and uh, uh, <laughs> and see what he does. There's the, the, uh, the program he put forth to, uh, be his, uh, legacy after he retires in 2030, the goals for 2030 to 2036 are very ambitious. They're there. They're going to be read, uh, and it's like I said, they're them and, and China and their joint declarations are very transparent, and, and yep. you, know, you can read what they're trying to do. Yep, we got to. Uh, we're almost at the two hour mark. I think we got to stop at the two hour mark. Yeah. Do we? Okay, we got twenty minutes. Um, I saw John Chadwick. Uh, yeah, John, we'll see your questions. Haven't seen you on screen before, so good to have you here far away when you're off mute okay i can you hear me now yeah yep oh well, great great okay i was listening to uh i follow all sorts of people probably that you follow and of course ben norton he just had a couple of great shows on mexico now that uh, was very interesting that uh, was how amlo had such an incredibly high favorability rating 80 percent just incredible and then uh the 
lady that just got elected, uh, Shinbaum, I think is her name, and she's going the same route. Now here I'm in Canada, so we're the, the northern neighbors and Mexico is the, are the southern neighbors. And I think, you know, it sure would be nice if we were turning more down the road of Mexico and uh, Mexico is working on reindustrializing and uh, working with China and uh, he has all sorts of details of things they've, they've done to alleviate poverty. So it's just such an incredible turnaround. And then I think of Millet in Argentina and all, all these other different countries. Uh, I follow uh, Brian Berletic. He covers a lot of uh, Southeast Asia and how you know how the United States has a lot of non chins that uh, interfere with the politics. So, I don't have much hope for uh, Canada. I think it has uh, <laughs> okay. problems that the United States have. Uh, the Liberal Party is uh, uh, really we, uh, uh, an extension of uh, the U.S. military, basic, basically, and Wall Street. Uh, the banks uh, uh, dominate Canada uh, and dominated it uh, long before the American banks really uh, became so uh, influential in the American economy. The five Canadian banks were taking over. Yes, yes, I've read, I've read, I've read all that from your website. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. I know all that stuff, but uh, let me get let me get to the point. The point is, uh, have you ever found any any patterns as to why some countries are 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 more likely now to turn around? Like uh, Ben Norton said, Mexico, like uh, the, the the U.S. has a tremendous influence on their media. It just just as our media is completely captured. I mean, we have a third party called the NDP, the Socialist Party, that was born from uh, the start of Medicare, right? So it had a really great origin. But mm -hmm. you know, the the mainstream media will just uh, destroy them and say any of the ideas that you put forth are are just not going to work. But somehow, somehow, Mexico has has and AMLO. I guess I question: Is it the leader? Is he an amazing leader, or are there conditions in Mexico? Like what what turns a country around? Is it a leader, or are there economic or other conditions that that cause it to turn around? A precondition for turning around is to think of themselves as. Uh... A, a national identity independent of the United States. Uh, Canada has always looked at, at uh, itself as uh, just a follower of the United States, uh, literally in time. Uh, when I worked for the State Department in Canada, uh, we did a study and uh, of, of uh, Canadian, uh, uh, Canadian perceptions. We I was trying to think, how do we improve the Canadian uh, educational system and uh, the uh, the film uh, nurture the uh, film industry. Canada had a uh, was a, one of the leaders of documentary films uh, for a long time. How do we encourage uh, right uh, uh, that? Well, uh, the uh, the answer was uh, a feeling of having a national identity so that it could become uh, something uh, independent. Uh, of the United States. Well, certainly controlling uh, the media, the media control is very important. I used to like the, uh, in the 60s, I loved the Canadian Post. Uh, that was, uh, a very, I always look forward to, to that paper. Uh, and all of that really is, uh, uh, it's, uh, the corruption uh, basically spreading from the uh, the Liberal Party. Uh, whenever I've gone to Canada, uh, I, all I hear from the uh, locals, uh, from British Columbia uh, all the way to uh, Montreal uh, has been uh, about uh, how uh, corrupt the, uh, the political and economic uh, processes there. And I don't know uh, what the solution uh, is is to that. It's, a, it's a, a different kind of an economy. It was never really an industrial economy. Uh, some Canadians explained to me that because it was so uh, 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 settled largely by, uh, by Scottish and British and uh, Irish uh, population, they were all sort of interacting people population. They went in, into trade, into merchandising, uh, or into mining, 
uh, they, they didn't go into course, industry. Yeah. It's, it's a whole different uh, uh, concept. And back in the, uh, I think, early 1970s, when I was in Canada, they had a whole uh, argument over national identity. What, were they, were they WAPs? What uh, uh, Anglo Celtic Protestant, white Anglo Celtic Protestants, not a, uh, uh, and the, the, it wasn't an economic identity basically at all. It was really a sort of a cultural, uh, uh, interpersonal identity. All that has sort of been uh, engulfed. And uh, what we found in the uh, in the polls that we did was that uh, Canadians thought that they, they were going to be. Uh, just three years behind America. Whatever was happening in America, that was going to be Canada in three years. Well, the result is that the Canadian society didn't work. And think of it as an oyster producing pearls. Almost all the American comedians and actors come from Canada. How do you cope if you're growing up in Canada? You got to become a comedian because otherwise you just get very depressed. <laughs> Jim Carrey and Mike Myers. Yeah, yeah. We've had some great uh, Canadian actors and uh, yeah. Uh, but but our but I agree that our our media and our we have a duopoly. It's almost a mirror of the United States is duopoly, and uh, I I just we when we have you know it's it's the French and the English. We have the the French that in, Montreal, in Quebec, but it doesn't matter when you look at the national newspapers. It's 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 gone. Just you can't. I think Jeffrey Sachs says, he says, I can't even look at the New York Times and the Washington Post. And I'm the same way. I can't look at the Globe and Mail or the Toronto Star. It's just yep. Yep. It's such extreme propaganda that we're just so sunk. And I try to point out so often when on Twitter that the banks are the enemy, essentially. And everyone thinks, oh, our banks are stable. So our banks are the good guys. And they're making all these billions of dollars off these inflated mortgages, and no one, no one understands this financialization. No one has a concept of what's going on. So, yeah, I think it's absolutely hopeless here. Well, that's why the internet is so good. The internet is the is the uh, uh, the escape. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, I appreciate your material. Th thanks for your comment. Thanks, John. Um, let's go to Flo. We've got John Douglas uh, coming up next. Sure. Um, and hi, John. I would like to say hello to another Canadian. I'm up in uh, British Columbia. Um, oh, I have a question, I guess, about the Belton Road Initiative, but a quick comment on that. Like, it's become so clear to me, um, you know, what you've been saying, Michael, about the junk economics, the double speak the diverging economies. And now that I can see what they mean when they're talking about a healthy economy, I was just reading a Bank of Canada um, press release a couple of weeks ago uh, on, the, on the state of the economy. And it's like what you were saying, John, everybody loves to harp on how strong the banking system is. They say, oh, we have the stress tests. And uh, because obviously our banking system is um majority uh mortgages i think it's that like 78 or 70 percent or so of all bank lending is for mortgages um so as long and now they're they're pulling all these little tricks to make it easier for people to continue to service their debt it's all about servicing the debt that's how they measure the health of the economy so uh there's way extended amortization rates now like some are like 70 years i've seen it's not so typical but you know, there it's just indefinite debt peonage for mortgages. Uh, yeah, nationalized mortgage lending. Um, so yeah, it's just in incredible. Like, yes, our maybe our banks aren't as vulnerable to the systemic risk that is more apparent in the the U.S. banking system, but that does not mean that you know, for the majority of people, that life is any easier or better, right? And that's that's where I think there's a big disconnect. Um, so anyways, I'd like to hear more comments on that if, if you have any thoughts. But uh, my question about the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, I was in a bit of a debate with someone. So they were basically saying that uh, the Belt and Road, it's China doing the same kind of a thing as the IMF and World Bank development loans. <laughs> yeah, but at a lesser rate of profit. And I was like, no, my understanding is they're very structurally different, but 
I did struggle to specify in, in what ways. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the specific ways that the mo the, the model is del different in the Belton Road um, from the, the IMF model. Well, if China were to uh, simply uh, say, well, we're going to be the new IMF and the World Bank, uh, what reason would uh, African countries, uh, uh, South Asian countries, uh, South American countries have uh, to join it? They say, you know, we, we want an alternative. Uh, we don't want to go down that route. So uh, China is in the position, uh, 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 obligated to uh, use its wealth uh, is a form of mutual aid in order to create a uh, new, uh, more than a block, uh, a new civilizational alternative to the West. And that's how it's really looking. It's uh, socialism versus barbarism. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, 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 it cannot afford to uh, use its, uh, uh, its uh, investment uh, as a means of uh, exploitation, uh, as occurs in the Western financialized economies. It had, instead of making uh, loans or financial investments, it's actually uh, cr uh, creating tangible means of production, tangible uh, increase in uh, productivity and uh, productive powers to sort of redesign how a national economy with its uh, resources, with its labor, uh, with its educational institutions and its population, how it can play a, uh, 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 be enabled to be uh, productive and uh, self-fulfilling in a way that is not occurring in the West with its, uh, uh, I guess what my friend David Graeber called shit jobs or bullshit jobs. <laughs> so, uh, uh, China could not simply, no country would, would accept uh, a replication of uh, uh, the neoliberal Western policies. That's why they're joining the BRICS uh, and why more and more countries are uh, joining it because they realize not only uh, is the economic philosophy different, <clears throat> but as a military bloc, uh, it's an alternative from uh, uh, joining the, the U.S. Uh, uh, war bloc. Uh, it's you can almost think of it as the peace block versus the war block. Well, quick follow up to that. What would you say if someone says that's all just kind of propaganda, or you know, that's what they would like you to believe? Um, but if, if if that weren't the case, then why would other countries wanting to be joining? Other countries are leaving, are <laughs> uh, aiming to withdraw from the IMF. Uh, to withdraw from the World Bank, to reject uh, that whole approach. That's why uh, they're they're joining the BRICS because they want an alternative, and uh, the uh, the alternative has to uh, help them in the short term as well as the long term. Uh, in uh, or else uh, they'd be voted out of out of power uh, domestically and by uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, media and uh, China would not be able to uh, create this uh, alternative to the Western civilization along with uh, Iran, Russia, and all the others. There has to be the choices between a multipolar and a unipolar society, uh, as they've said again and again and again. They have to uh, respect, uh, aim at national self-sufficiency and basic economic rights in human rights uh, uh, to survival, uh, rights to housing, rights to uh, an education, rights to all of the basic needs that uh, the Western model is not uh, uh, not designing. And I think uh, that's what all these meetings are, the, the accelerating intensity of meetings uh, be between the uh, uh, BRICS leaders uh, with each other. Uh, you can see they're trying to effectively draw up a constitution, or at least a, a prolegmena to a constitution. I'd Lovely. Like to ask a, I'd like to ask a follow up to that, if that's okay, Carl. Go ahead, uh, Virginia. So, so we know that when the IMF makes loans or negotiates loans, they, there's structural adjustment. A country that wants to borrow has to cut back on any public services, social services. Basically, they have to institute an austerity budget. Does China 
insist on anything like that. <laughs> Obviously not, because that's not it does itself. Uh, the the whole Chinese revolution was uh, to provide an alternative to that. And they managed to do it to, in China. <clears throat> and they would like to help uh, other countries uh, do the uh, follow uh, the same kind of model. But that that entails, above all, financial independence from the dollarized West. It means they have to uh, uh, transact uh, trade and investment and saving in their own currencies uh, or in a group, uh, 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 their own currencies that have a some kind of standardized uh, uh, relative value uh, so that credit uh, and investment can, and trade uh, can take place uh, alternatively to uh, the, the conditions, the trade and investment and savings with the West had to, had to do. That's what we're talking about. And that, that's what makes it a different civilization. A, a different economy is a different civil uh, basis for uh, uh, how to create an economy is the question that any civilization uh, faces. And that's the question that is uh, faced today by uh, the global majority, the 85%, saying there is an alternative to what uh, the Western NATO 15% uh, and neoliberals are, are, uh, say is natural. We're not at the end of history. We're at the beginning of a new history of a revival from the Western detour from civilization that occurred 2000 years ago. Lovely. Um, Diana's counting down the minutes that we've got left here. And I noticed John Douglas has his hand up. We haven't seen him on screen before. So uh, Virginia, can we get him up? Here he comes. Yeah, it's much better when people come on screen. Let's try and get this happening earlier. Um, yeah, John, but didn't, John didn't want to come on screen, but I okay. just unmuted. Oh. So go ahead, John. Hey, Michael, I'm a big fan of your books, Red Killing the Host and Forgive Them Their Deaths, Super Imperialism. And I really like the Carl Polanyi uh, talking about how the goal of wealth creation is really to increase your you know, social standing in order to help other people. And I know you kind of answered this question just now a little bit, but you know, I don't know if everyone else had a similar thing, but you know, we have got all these articles saying like, oh, China's on the brink of collapse. They're totally doomed. You know, their population is, you know, aging out everything. But Really, the discussion is like what you said, that banking is a public utility over there. So I wanted to get your opinion on the Evergrande collapse and their reaction versus the 08 and how we responded. I think the the whole idea, the whole way in which Evergreen uh, evolved was uh, the, uh, the, the fact that China had a philosophy of let a hundred flowers bloom. Uh, we're not going to try to be centrally located, centrally planned like uh, the Stalinist economy uh, uh, was. Uh, we're going to let uh, each of the local uh, uh, regions and, and cities uh, uh, take their own control. And so the mayors, local mayors in China uh, were very important. Well, that was that those decisions were made 50 years ago, 70 years ago. But now it, it's clear that some uh, uh, the, the the problem that developed was how are you going to get local cities self financing? Well, the uh, the the way that they were financing themselves was to uh, to uh, sell uh, real estate or real estate uh, uh, the ability to hold real estate uh, tenure uh, to uh, the real estate developers and Evergreen and other companies uh, made money this way and the. Uh, they began to develop uh, largely with uh, borrowed money. And uh, Chinese began to look at uh, having a house as the means of saving. Certainly in Chinese society, the whole idea of getting married was uh, uh, the girl had to find uh, a boy uh, whose family would uh, give them uh, the house. That's what uh, it was explained to me uh, over there. Well, the result was that uh, as China became more prosperous, housing prices were going up. And uh, the reason uh, Chinese put their money into real estate was they, they saw that it was going up and uh, it was the rising real estate prices that was the became the Achilles 
heel of the Chinese economy. So uh, most of my discussions in China are saying, uh, you, uh, you don't want housing prices to go up. You really, uh, if the, the cities uh, and uh, local uh, districts of China would have had a uh, uh, based their revenue on a land tax as the as the price of uh, 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 housing goes up, it's really the price of land that's going up. And if they would have had uh, the land tax, which is what uh, uh, the, the Chinese advocated in Sun Yat-sen uh, advocated uh, in the early 20th century, uh, you, you would have prevented the whole uh, inflation of housing prices that was largely a financial phenomenon, uh, but also a fiscal phenomenon by the way, in, uh, because there was not a revenue sharing between the central government and the cities because they wanted, they didn't want to be a centralized controlling. Well, now that they've seen the experiments, they've seen which uh, uh, ways of development uh, worked and which ways didn't work, uh, it, it's time to reintroduce this. Well, if you introduce a, a land tax uh, now uh, and uh, prices for buildings can go up, but not uh, the price of the land, if that's uh, going to happen, then uh, yeah, a lot of the financial institutions, uh, the private uh, banks are going to go under. And uh, that probably is uh, uh, a policy that would return China to the original idea of having money and credit as a uh, uh, basically public, public function. That's the uh, discussion that is... Uh, uh, the, the most critical uh, in China today. You could say no more Evergrande's. They should say no more uh, housing price inflation as, uh, as if you're getting rich when your house price goes up. The house price goes up and that just makes it harder and harder and harder for the population to get housing. Housing is uh, a, 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 a basic need. It's a basic human right. And uh, the way to provide this right is not to inflate the price of housing, but to prevent it from going up by treating the, uh, the uh, rising land, the la rising site location, the rent of location that increases as society economies become more uh, prosperous, as uh, cities are built up with more and more amenities, as transportation is uh, uh, increased and uh, so uh, to affect the economics and livability of various locations, uh, you, you have to go back uh, to the classical economic economists of the 19th century, from Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, Marx, uh, uh, all of them uh, talked uh, uh, Simon Patton, they all talked about uh, land rent as being uh, the key challenge that uh, societies had to uh, deal with along with uh, interest-bearing debt. And uh, the uh, the influence of uh, sort of Shanghai and the uh, neoliberal uh, Chicago school uh, of financialization uh, had sort of worked against all of this. And now uh, China's trying to put it back together. They're really trying to reintegrate the economy uh, and Evergrande was a sign of the disintegration and economic polarization coming from not uh, solving the question of how are you going to treat land rent and consequently the the cost of housing and uh, doing business uh, uh, throughout the whole economy. How do you avoid China ending up looking like uh, the U.S. Uh, 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 financialized uh, real estate sectors uh, ended up uh, leading to the crash that we talked about at the beginning of this show. Wow. Thank Excellent. you for answering. Oh. Excellent. Well, there we are. We've just run over two hours. So um, thank you, uh, Patreons. Thank you again for your support. It really means a huge difference to Michael and all his team. Um, a big thanks to all, all the real progressives as well. Thanks, Virginia, John, and um, crew in the background. Great to have your support as well to help us along. And, uh, yeah, great to get to know more of you uh, on screen. And, um, yeah, love to uh, see a bit more of um, that interaction going. Michael's getting better and better at posting on Patreon. Those Financial Times articles are really good. So um, good to see the discussion there and um, be good to see some of you posting your work on Patreon as well. 
So there we have it, Michael. Well done. Another fascinating discussion and really looking forward to that transcription. Um, that overview you gave at the start was uh, just brilliant. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, I'm going to have dinner now. Okay. I'll go for Lovely. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye, you. Everyone. Put my Twitter handle in the chat if anyone wants to add me. Okay. Oh, okay. Bon appetit. Okay. <laughs> Next time, Michael has to have a glass of water with him. I do have a glass of water. Yeah. Well, because you're you're. I have to have time to drink a co a cough drop. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's what you need. Okay. Great. Right. Great. All right. See you guys. Okay. Yep. Bye, everyone. Yeah, I'm going to turn off now. Thanks. Bye. Okay.